one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends. I'm your host, Ray Shasho. As with all good meals, the sweets are the most memorable. It's no wonder that guitar legend Juan Carlos Guinieto's critically acclaimed chart-topping 2022 release, Table for Five, segues so effortlessly to the sequel of the new album, Desserts. Quintero's new album expands the music menu, producing tasty treats while skillfully blending authentic grooves originating from South American and Caribbean regions, culminating in a thread of meaningful performances honoring the beauty and breadth of Latin jazz traditions. Enticing gems, including The Gift, All or Nothing at All, How Insensitive, Tangerine, a Night in Tunisia, along came Betty and crowd favorite Van Morrison's Moondance. This seasoned quartet never disappoints as it navigates an array of well-crafted classics reimagined with newly fine-tuned arrangements. Please welcome legendary Latin jazz guitar composer, record producer, uh, Juan Carlos Quinieto to interviewing the legends. Hello, Juan Carlos. How are you, man? Hey, Ray. It's good to be with you. Thanks for having me. What was the last time you were in Colombia? Now you're from. How do you pronounce it? Is it Medellin or how do you pronounce it? Uh, Medellin. 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 Okay, yeah. I didn't do my homework there. What was the, <laughs> What was the last time uh, you were there? Uh, it's it's been about um, I want to say uh, just under three years. I go often for uh, um, family, you know, and I, I, sometimes I go down there to do work as well. I, I produce uh, musicians down there. And um, but either way, it's it's always, um, you know, it's, it's, it feels more like a vacation. every Right. Time. Right. Yeah. Now they, they call that the city of eternal spring, right? It's, it's known as the city of eternal spring. My travels, however, are always to Bogota. Mm hmm. Um, where, where family resides and um it's very much like uh you know the city is kind of like um i would say like los angeles in many ways right you know it's, uh it's uh heavily populated and surrounded by um you know an outline of mount mountains and um and it has that you know that busy you know city feel to it it's when you get out you know from the city things change dramatically um but you know, it depends what you're you're looking for. If you want that experience, you know that that separate culture from the city itself, then you know that's there. And of course, you go out um, beyond the city into the countryside. That's a, another culture that that's also um, magical, you know, and it mm -hmm. has its own vibe to it. And so, people there, you know, when I meet people in Bogota, they're always in and out of the city for that reason. You know, they're always you know, stepping away, coming back in, and it's reminiscent of of my of my days in in Los Angeles. I got a feeling too. Um, Colombia's got a great nightlife because the women are beautiful from Colombia, <laughs> and they dress to kill. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny that comes up often, and uh, uh, I, I'm one of the lucky guys. I married one, and uh, <laughs> so I, I'm surrounded by beauty all day. You know, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to know a lot of Colombian women in D.C., you know, and as a matter of fact, our housekeeper was from Colombia as well. Uh, we always had Colombian housekeepers for some reason. They were, they're the, <laughs> you know, they're so nice, you know, and personable and everything. But uh, uh, let's get to the music. How difficult is it to combine Latin and jazz rhythms together? Well, for me, it didn't come so easily. It's... Uh... And I'm always amazed by uh, other, um, you know, other players, mm -hmm. especially younger players, man, that could just, you know, go into it effortlessly. Um, for me, it was a study. I had to, you know, I had to kind of figure it out. Um, really, because, you know, you, you take all the rhythms, the different uh, types of rhythms, and uh, you need to honor that when you're dealing with those uh, traditions. Uh, you, you realize really, really fast that... Um, you know, you're, you're, you're messing with the, 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 the art in the museum, you know, right? It, exactly. It really involves some careful handling. If you're going to do cha-cha-cha, rumba, uh, danzon, 
mm-hmm. uh, cumbia, man, you 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 better know what you're doing, you know, because um, you can get uh, you can miss a lot of the nuances of what that's about, and kind of skip over it, and suddenly you're you're just kind of doing this this kind of weird hybrid, you know. Mm. Um, but if you if you do the research and you really dive in, and for me, I, it was a matter of learning from the musicians I work with. You know, they're the ones that that taught me a lot of what's you know um, what that's about. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I, I remain a student. You know, it's uh, there's so much to learn from all the various uh, rhythms. A lot of the rhythms uh, they're regional. You know, and so right away you're in the study again. You know what that's about. It's sort of like food. You know. Yeah. Uh, just different recipes come from different regions and Mm -hmm. there's a thing that makes it unique you know um so uh rhythms when you go in the throughout the world not just latin music is very much like that Mm -hmm. um but my guys teach me all the time so you know i'm i'm in study all the time i'm (laughs) you know i'm in the i'm in the art of studying you know Musicians are always studying, you know, and always. And you guys never give her, give yourself enough credit either. You're always kind of down on yourselves, <laughs> <laughs> you know. I never well, understood that. <laughs> it's, it's a hum, it's a humbling life life yeah. journey, you know. You're trying to figure it out. I mean, the way I, I deal with music now is completely different than when, um, you know, I started out, and certainly mm-hmm. even five years ago. You know, I would think about how I managed. Uh, the, vo- the vocabulary I knew at that time to what I'm doing now. And hopefully it's going to progress, you know, and, and, and maybe appear in the next album, you know? Um, but you're always trying, trying to evolve, you know? I, you know, I interview a lot of legends and, you know, a lot of electric guitar legends and I might get in trouble here, but I admire the acoustic player more than I do the electric player. You know, if he, plays electric and acoustic that's cool but acoustic right. is is you know it's it's so hard and to get your fingers you know th- without hurting and 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 you know it, it it's it's so different that the strings are different totally. you know it, it's so it's so easy to play electric and just you know especially with a lot of fuzz and you know all the electronic gimmicks they have nowadays but you play yeah, you- acoustic guitar beautifully man well uh you know uh most of my records are on nylon guitar you know it's featuring mm-hmm. the, the the acoustic sound and uh you're right to your point it's it's a it, it's a more intense route it's a, even more difficult in, in many ways is you know you're more exposed that's for sure definitely you know? yeah you can't hide behind um <laughs> any you know reverb or delays and, and tricks of the studio you can't really do that and um but there's something great because of that mm-hmm. you know it, it you're able to record a, a kind of a it's just an extra layer of uh, vulnerability mm-hmm. you know that kind of uh translates to what that vibe is all about you know yeah um, not to say you can't do that with electric. We, you know, I play clean, so I don't, I don't use any um, effects or anything like that. So it's more right. of a jazz, you know, like a clean jazz vibe, and uh, and that's just a, you know, the electric for me is just like this intense microphone mm-hmm. on the speaker. You know, it is. You're right. It exposes, you know, stuff that you have to live with. You know, mm-hmm. and, and when I compare notes with other guitar players, man, we we all we all live with stuff. You know, mm-hmm. we. It's like we all need a warehouse to live with our guitar solos. We could store all the guitar solos <laughs> in the warehouse and just we just live with them, you know. It doesn't mean we bring them out all the time. But um you know, sometimes you land on your feet, you know, it's sort of like a a um a gymnast, mm-hmm. you know. Uh you go for it and you've practiced the routine, mm-hmm. you know, you, you practice a lot of the 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 um the steps of what you're what you know should happen but then something else may happen because right. of improvisation and you just hope that you land on your feet you know that exactly it works, you know melodically and that it has the right groove and it's what you meant to say you know um but there's some records i remember you know there's some tracks i remember being kicked out of the studio by my producers you know just like okay that was it man you know mm-hmm. we captured it sure 
One time. I'm like, yeah, but one, one more, man. I need one more time, you know? <laughs> and they're like, no, you're going home. That's, we're good, you know? That's uh, why you have a producer. <laughs> yeah. You'd be all, you'd be there all day, you know? He knows when it's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, these last two records I produced and, uh, and I learned some really tough lessons uh, right. about that very thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Because you can uh, over record trying to, sure. you know, fix yourself you know and man you know you know what is, what is that you know you, you can get into tr- some trouble there um so actually on my next record i already enlisted my, uh, my producer from the past Guillermo oh Guzman, really oh great come back uh because I, i'm exhausted man after two albums of wearing that hat like wow <laughs> i mean you know i can produce other people but uh producing myself um i'm glad i did it you know it's it was a it was a thing that I wanted to to get into and, and mm-hmm. really um, work on. I'm proud of what happened, but um, I think moving forward, uh, you know, bringing that extra, uh, that guidance, that mentorship, that partner that, that'll give you some objectivity about what you're up to is always a useful thing. It's very helpful. Sure. So, I agree. Um, I look forward. I, I look forward to getting back to that. Yeah. Well, here's what I said about the new album. <clears throat> Desserts by Juan Carlos Quintero is a beautiful acoustic rendition of timeless classics. Juan Carlos is a true master of jazz and Latin guitar and composition. Desserts will be enjoyed by everyone who enjoys a laid back frame of mind and magnificent vibes. Five stars. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Wow, man. It's, it's great, it's, it's great man. That. It's <laughs> you nada, that, man. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna, it's, I'm gonna talk about some Friday. of the tracks. It's not even Friday. We'll take that. You know? <laughs> I'm gonna talk about some of the tracks. First of all, tangerine. You know, that's if you add a little heavier electric guitar, it'll sound like Santana. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah. anytime you do Latin rhythms, and uh, yeah. if you hit that, you hit that distortion uh, uh, pedal. You're going to go there. You're going to end up on that island pretty fast, you know. I love the piano on the track. Uh, also, who's who's playing piano? That's uh, Joe Rotundi, who's who's been with me for. Uh, he's excellent. Yeah, over 25 years. He, you know, he's my he's my uh, right hand uh, man, as as the other guys are. I don't serve Fati on drums. Uh, Eddie Resto on bass. Uh, Joey De Leon on percussion. They're, they're mm-hmm. my team, and we've we've been playing together for so many years. Um, I affectionately call them my East Street band. You know, yeah. Um, there's a shorthand there with what we do, and um, I'm 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 very blessed to to, to be with these guys, and they, um, I'm already looking forward to the next record. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. But Tangerine, I think the lyrics were by Johnny Mercer, a yeah. uh, song way back in 1941, which became a jazz standard. It's a sure. it's a great song, especially on acoustic, and it's, it's it's a wonderful tune. You do a great job with that one. Thank um, you. The gift, track two, very kind of jazzy Latino sounds. Um, I I put a note there. If Jeff Beck played Latin rhythms, that's what it would sound like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to take that as a compliment because I'm a huge fan <laughs> of Jeff Beck, and uh, you know. Uh, when he left us, it was, a, it was you know, it hit hard for, for yeah. all of us in the guitar community, especially. But if you were just a fan of um, original uh, musicianship, you, 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 you know, you, you understood, um, you know, what Jeff Beck was trying to convey all the time. And it was always fresh and it was all about improvisation mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, a unique style, a unique voice, you know which is really hard to get on, on the, on the instrument. Yeah. And, um, but he had it and he's had it for so many years that, you know, you just take advantage. You you think that's like, that's the way it should be, you know, until you try it. Yeah. And he didn't <laughs> uh, play with a pick either. <laughs> yeah, play with a pick and that, that gave him a sound and, and, and a, and a yeah. vibe. The, the gift is an interesting song actually, because I remember uh, growing up, and hearing that in, in my parents' living room, uh, Edie Gourmet had, had mm-hmm. a big hit on that. And um, it's kind of like a lost gem. You don't hear it too often. Uh, certainly not covered a lot. And um, so I kind I just kind of rediscovered it when I was going through tunes. Um, 
and it was Edie Gourmet's uh, recording that, that got my attention. And I thought, wow, this would be nice on guitar. And that's you right. Know, just the, way, the way it spells out. And um, so that's our take, you know, on that, on, on that one day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I hope people like it, you know. And of course, uh, track three, you know, I'm going to love that one. Estapa Cubana. Yeah. George right Shearing. <laughs> Anything yeah. that says Kuwana on it, you know, you know, I'm going to love that. Yeah. <laughs> you did a wonderful job with that one. Yeah, Edmundo uh, Peraza is a composer. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Armando, sorry, I mispronounced that. Armando. He, he was the percussion of the George Shearing in the early 60s right. and into the mid 60s. And he, he was part of those Latin records that George Shearing did. And um, this is one of the tunes they did. Um, so it's really a nod. Um, to not only uh, a great you know composer, but just the way George Shearing's um, quintet handled that tune, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's all out of respect. You know, when you do standards and you rearrange them in any way, you're 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 always trying to honor the the composer, you right? Know, and the original recording of what that was about. Sure. And so we're just um, you know we're sitting on their shoulders all the time. Uh, track four. Oh my goodness. That King Cole, Nature Boy. Oh, you yeah. guys nail that one, man. Uh, one Thank thing you. about Nat King Cole, <laughs> my mom went, she used to date somebody that worked at the Tropicana. And oh, really? they sent her to pick up the uh, the talent. And she picked oh, wow. up Nat King Cole one day in, in, in the car and brought, her, brought him to the club. She got to bring Bing Crosby and... Robert nice. Taylor and a few other people. So <laughs> I just wanted to mention that. <laughs> wow, that's that's interesting. Yeah, yeah that, that tune is actually a very difficult song to play. Uh, Sounds like it. Yeah. So it's so it's really simple, uh, and that's what makes it difficult. Is because <laughs> you know the 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 sixth member of the mm -hmm. group in our case, you know, would be um, the silent member you know it's really the space right you have to allow um for, for the song to to work it's it's not playing it's actually holding back and um at this age i feel like i can tackle that a little a little more comfortable mm -hmm. you know, comfortably than uh in prior days it's such a hard tune to play you know when you go into ballads um for me at least it's a, it's a challenge and then have a conversation, music, a music conversation with mm -hmm. musicians where they're also in, the, in a good place and a comfortable place to have this thing happen. Um, it was just it was a it's just a good time for me to try something like that. And, and I, again, being surrounded by the musicians uh, that I work with is that it just makes it possible, you know. Well, you, when, when you play so long together, it's like it's very natural, you know. You, yeah like you guys know what each other are thinking and that yeah. kind of thing you know it's it's great yeah. it's such an advantage you know it is it really is. It is how long how many takes did it take you to record nature boy i think nature boy was about two takes oh that's good uh, yeah. most of the most of the album was like that uh every mm -hmm. song was two or three takes and the reason for even those uh takes were was because we were uh changing the arrangement Mm -hmm. So we would take, you know, we'd do a take and feel pretty good, but then we'd realize, okay, maybe the intro needs to be shorter or maybe, um, you know, uh, it needs to start with just bass instead of the full band. You know, we dress down the, 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 the orchestration so that it would evolve. It would go somewhere. Right. So really each take was about a discussion about how we were going to alter what we just did. Mm. And then, um, so really, by the time we did the 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 new version, you know, which maybe take two or take three, it mm -hmm. was really take one of that new iteration, of that new arrangement. So they feel really fresh uh, because of that, and hopefully a little edgy in some yeah. spots, you know, where we're taking um, some risks, you know, and, and it's not a, um, you know, it's not an overproduced right uh, concept. I mean, I wanted it to sound nice and clean. And the arrangements to be the production, mm -hmm. it's the idea of how we're storytelling. But um, yeah, we didn't we didn't take too many takes, which is which is uh, 
a nice way to do it, do it. And, and again, with these guys, you can do that. Sure. And, and it's a nice long track too. Sometimes you hear a great song and it, and they cut it short and you're, you're always wanting more, you know, this one was yeah. what, six minutes and 55 seconds, which is. Oh yeah. Know. Yeah. We were, <laughs> we were looking at the clock, obviously, <laughs> but you know, it's what happened, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, track five, I guess in English, it's how insensitive and, um, it's a kind of a bossa nova jazz standard song. It's Brazilian, right? Brazilian tune. Yeah, it's a classic Joe Beam. Yeah. Uh, song, you know, from the Joe Beam uh, repertoire. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, again, we just did our, our unique take on it. Um, uh, you know, we, we when I arrange, I, I try to create these little riffs, little motifs that would bracket right. the song, and while still honoring the song in, in the best possible way. So uh, we discussed that quite a bit, um, how we're going to create arrangements and house them, house the song um, with other motifs that I'm bringing in. Little, you know, again, there, there can be little licks, little little gems. Mm -hmm. But you don't want you don't want them to distract from the song itself because that's been worked out by the master, you know, in this case, Joe Beam. So uh, uh, I I, th I think we did OK on this. Uh, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. We didn't over overstate, the, you know, the idea of uh, of an arrangement and just let it flow. Sure. Uh, but it's all, always careful handling because these songs are. They're precious, you know, they, they've been worked out. Right. You know. <laughs> they were worked out when I was a kid, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, the selection you did on this album of of the music is is incredible. You did a great job with 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 the music you picked out. Oh, I um, appreciate that. So, Thank you. what do you do? You get the sheet music from each after you pick each tune, and then you start working it, and then you start putting your own flair into it. And uh, you know, on this album and the previous album, it was really about all these standards, you know. Right. And this album, this album um, is really a part two of Table for Five. Mm -hmm. I, I really think of them as as a double album. Okay. Just you know, staggered over a year. You know? Right. And um, that's why it's called Desserts because the previous one was Table for Five, right? So right. You have after <laughs> the meal, you have desserts. Uh, so it's really an extension of that of that record, um, but I start with about thirty songs mm -hmm. to take, and uh, songs that I've always wanted to record, and the songs that are introduced by uh, the musicians and friends of mine, uh, other musicians, um, and things that we've tried on, uh, you know, in concert, where we never recorded it, but we always did it in concert, um, just because it fit the set list in a nice mm -hmm. way. Sure. So the, all those considerations end up on the table. And then I go through like easily 30 songs and see if, see how they can become, you know, like a family. So, right. You know, we grew up on albums. Mm -hmm. So it, to me, it, it's got to work in, in that way. It has to be a storytelling <clears throat> experience if possible. So, so we ended up with 10 and that's, how, that's what we have. How did you first listen to the songs for the first time. I mean, do you have the collection of albums? Do, do some of the band just bring in an album from their collection or is that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I remember th most of these from uh, when I was a kid right? In, in, in my parents' living room. You know, I, I was in the, my bedroom uh, learning uh, Led Zeppelin and <laughs> Jeff Beck and uh, Bad Company. You know? Yeah. I still love that stuff, you know, sure. uh, working out Frampton, you know? Right. And, uh, but I downstairs and I, I, I joined my parents. This is the music that they were playing. You yeah. Know? And so, uh, it was really, um, a matter of, uh, just, just plugging into that, uh, memory. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, th another thing that comes out of playing standards when, when you do that, you're, you're honoring your parents. Exactly. That, that's yeah. what happens. Yeah, it just kind of sneaks up on you. You know, you sure. think, oh man, I'm going to play these standards, and yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to work it out this way. I'm going to do it my way. But then you start thinking, okay, why are you, why are you even, why are you in love with this music? Mm -hmm. You know, what's that about? And so it just points back to, uh, in my case, you know, uh, my parents. You know, 
Yeah. So it's really uh, the love affair with my with my parents and honoring their their heritage and uh, their sensibility about great music. It was in the house the whole time. You yeah. Know? I was dealing with my great music in my bedroom. You know, right. the, the, the music my friends and I were into. And I didn't know that their stuff was was really it, right? Like really it, you know. Like yeah, the melodies, man. The melodies are just like incredible. Yeah, composers always say this about the melodies from the early '60s that all the phone, all the good phone numbers were taken. Yeah, it's true. And, and when you think about that, like, damn, you know, yeah. okay, <laughs> it's kind of true, you know. Yeah, the good all the ones great. Were taken. All the great jazz artists that we grew up with, I mean, or, or our parents grew up with, you know? Right. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, Nat, Nat King Cole, I mean, I still love Johnny Mathis and oh man, uh, Andy Williams and, you know, all yeah. the crooners, you know? All the crooners. You know? I try to get them on my show, and I have. I've had Engelbert Humperdinck on the show. I've had Petula Clark. Wow. Because I'm honoring them on my show. You know, so funny you should men mention Engelbert. Uh, when I came to LA, um, he was my first tour that I did. Really? I was, Is that I right? I was his guitarist for two years. Very yeah. cool. It's 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 no longer on the resume, but it's a fun fact. It should be on the resume. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot. I was you know I was like uh, um, I was 24 years old by the time mm -hmm. I I got on with that. Yeah, and I was new to LA. And I was, you know, just uh, beginning to be a freelance musician, you know. Yeah. So I was doing session work and tours, and he was he was my first tour. And, How about uh, that? That's amazing. And I learned a lot. Yeah. You, you, you well, learn a lot on the road. He claims that the sideburns, he invented that, not Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he told me. <laughs> that sounds like Engelbert. <laughs> Engelbert, I remember, would say that. Yeah. yeah. He's a good guy. We we had a great interview together. He wished me happy anniversary because it was our anniversary, and, and yeah, really nice guy. I love you those know, guys back in the back in the day. Absolutely. Uh, the thing about those guys is that they really sang. Yep. You know, I mean, they were operatic in 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 um, in their study. You know, and yep. in, in, in their chops. You know, exactly. Um, the system could go down, and he could sing a cappella. Yep to a theater no problem yep and um i i saw tony bennett do that a couple times mm -hmm. um i never saw sinatra but i'm sure he he had the capability of doing doing that kind of thing i saw frank five times <laughs> oh man <laughs> see tony bennett was that for me i saw him like i don't know over 10 times it was absolutely insane i was a, you know true fan yeah but I, I didn't get to sinatra unfortunately yeah what I mean, his band was incredible, you know. And oh, that's yeah. best band I've ever saw was Sinatra's backup band, you know. It was they were always, you know, so tight, right on, you know, they were great. Did you see him with uh, Count Basie's band back was I, it back in the day? I did not. I saw him when New York New York came out. That's when I oh, first okay. saw him. And then we saw him at the Kennedy Center. Uh I saw him in Vegas at uh, Caesars, I saw him in Atlantic City as resorts. Uh, yeah. all over the place. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Always had good seats too. I I paid a lot of money to get front row seats in Vegas <laughs> and and Atlantic City. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, These yeah. Those incredible. guys. Uh, um, and they had a competition uh, amongst them. They had a you know it was a you know uh, um, it was all in good spirits. You know, mm -hmm. but they, they, there was a competition going on between. Um, Paul Lanka, you know, Humperdinck, uh, Tony Bennett, because they, you know, they had to really work their chops. It was all about, um, you know, the uh, uh, the journey of, of being on the road and singing. Right. You know, uh, all season, you know, they go out on the road in the winter and they they do those shows and they sang. I mean, they never hid. They had they mm -hmm. had to sing. You had to really lead a band as a singer because. The band, in our case, it was like fifteen musicians on stage. That's a that's a big sound. Yeah, and uh, they'd have to lead it. That's you know? right. So Engelbert had those chops. And he it was did. He had a powerful voice. Powerful man. voice, and he had the chops, and he had yeah. the endurance. So and they I did not have too. they did not have auto tune. <laughs> no, no tricks. No and, tricks. Uh, <laughs> 
you know, but back then when I was coming up, I mean, he was my first tour. I thought that's just how it was. Yeah. You know, things changed, you know, by the late eighties start, things started getting a little more glossy on stage. Right. You know, I'll put it nicely, you know, yeah. but um, it's when things started changing uh, in the live shows, that's when I realized looking back that mm -hmm. the, I was around some real heavy talent, yep. you know, and, um, and then, you know, if, man, all the musicians had to play too. We, yeah, that's right. We, none of, there were no tracks. We weren't playing along to any tracks. Yeah. So yeah, you you look back now at some some of the guys, and you you, you hear them playing acoustic, like Roy Rod, not Roy Rogers, uh, Roy Clark. Oh a, man, great, amazing player. Yeah. Oh amazing man, player. Glenn Campbell, another guy, an amazing yeah. player. That's right. You know. Yeah, I mean these guys were on TV when I was a kid. You know. Yeah. They would just be there and you they just would just like, be there and you know yeah. roy clark on he hall and then yeah. then you see him do malagania and you go whoa <laughs> you know yeah man he caused a lot of guitar lessons yeah yeah and he'd show up on the tonight show you know and you know he had this uh real you know, uh charming personality and then he'd play exactly uh, same with glenn campbell you know yeah they just had their thing those guys but are great. When they picked up the guitar, everyone paid attention, you know. You know, a lot of guys, including myself, started playing guitar with the Ventures. Oh, because, man, there you go. Because yeah. they're, they're so simple to learn from, but you know, right. and they had a, that nice, clean sound, you yeah. know. Yeah, that Fender sound. Yeah. Clean amp, yeah. They, they, were, they were incredible as well. Well, speaking of Sinatra, All or Nothing at All is on this album. Yeah, and it's it's uh you know i love how you added the latin flair to the song that is great thank you thank it you it's incredible that that's that's one that's um um it feels like a milestone to be able to to record uh perform and, and perform that one mm -hmm. uh, songs like that because you know you have to play a little bit before you get there right it, and um i think most players would agree with that Although there's some young guys that can play this stuff as if they're in their fifties or sixties, uh, which I always I'm amazed by, man. That yeah, you could be in your twenties and already have this sense about uh, very mature music, you know. But um, I think most of us have to get there. You know, we have to live a little bit and and play some music, sure. Or you finally get to that point where you understand how the melody, or you have a better understanding of how the melody should be treated. Mm -hmm. you know, and your sense of phrasing and um, knowing how to kind of understate um, the way Miles Davis would play a melody. Right. You know, or Chet Baker or cats like that. Yeah. Where they're kind of just whistling to you. They're just singing it to you. Yeah. You know, so I'm, tr I'm trying to get that. That's what that's what I'm. I'm it chasing. sounds sounds like it on this album to me, man. I was <laughs> man, really you. impressed. I loved it. Thank you. Great album. And a lot of people are going to say their favorite on this album has got to be Moon Dance because it's Van Morris, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I love the song, yeah. And that that's a crowd favorite when, when we oh, you yeah. know, do the shows, and it would be like a surprise because um, it's really the only time we're swinging. You know, we're mm -hmm. doing Latin rhythms all night, and then suddenly we're swinging, and uh, and it's a pop tune, really. Um, so yeah, it became a thing. Um, and I never recorded it, but I've been playing it for years. And so mm -hmm. finally, this time around, we thought, okay, let's let's try it. Let's see, let's see what happens. You know, is is your bass player is he stand up bass, all upright bass? That's Eddie upright. Resto. And yeah. uh, he's been. I love the upright bass. It's that it's, sound. It's got that genuine jazz sound to oh. it. You know. It's it's really elegant and and to me, it's very sophisticated. It you is. Know? And uh, the way he handles it is, um, you know, it's just with a lot of care and um, musicality. Mm -hmm. um, it's a hard, it's a hard instrument to overplay, but um, I have been play, I've been with players that overplay it. And um, how do you overplay Eddie it? Knows, Eddie knows how to allow space to be part of what that, you know, huh. what that, what that thing is, <clears throat> what that experience really is. So yeah, I mean he he I feature him all the time in the arrangements. 
Oh, um, it's great. We'll start, yeah, he'll start songs and and he'll we can break down uh, yeah. the instruments and, and feature him and then come back. And I do it with confidence every time because um, in his in his hands it, it's um, it's nothing but beauty, man. It's it's great. He makes it sound like a classic jazz piece, you know. Yeah, That's from right. the old days. Yeah. yeah, that's what it sounds like. Yeah, it does a good job. I mean, yeah. All these guys kind of bring that because I think right. they respect they they respect the the tradition of this music so much that um, you know for me. Uh, I'm in awe of the music as well, mm -hmm. but if I'm with them. I feel like, man, okay, you know, let's let's get serious because that's the vibe in the studio. You know, yep. when we get together. It's just, I mean, we have fun and everything, but when it's time to deal with the music, mm -hmm. it gets a little, in, you know, I would say it gets a little intense, you know, a little heavy because everyone's on this vibe. Like, okay, you know, so what are we doing here? You know. Because we know the albums, mm -hmm. um, okay. We all know Joe Beam. We all know Nat King Cole when he right. sang, you know, Danny, uh, um, uh, Nature Boy. Sorry, uh, we we all know the song, th this music, you know. And so, like, okay, how are we going to do it? You know, let, let's get real here. Let's let's get serious. And so that's that's what happens in the, in the session. Um, so the grooves are really, uh, it, for my ears you know really uh discipline um they're 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 full of that of that groove thing where you where you're not expecting anyone to interrupt it mm -hmm. to show off right you know, like no one no one's stepping out to go all right here's here's a little thing i want to play now now i'm coming back right everyone's true to the groove yeah and really disciplined and as a leader doing the vo uh, vocals via guitar mm-hmm now I have to, you know, rise to that, to right. the, the, that bar that they created, you know? No, so. it's an, it's a great blend. The band, you guys all blending perfect together, I think. Thank you. Yeah. I love it, man. You, you know, well, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of my own guys. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's... you know, I love, I love what they do and I, and I, and I love them each, you know, very much. Yeah. I'm excited about the next album. I mean, yeah. uh, I can't wait. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, music to watch girls by. Who picked that one? That's that's just it's a fun well, song. To, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a crazy title. Uh, <laughs> especially these days, you know, with the with the word police. But I had to go with it because um it's such a great melody. And I remember uh, the Andy Williams hit. And you know, my parents yep. had Andy Williams albums everywhere. And um so uh this one came about a friend of mine actually recommended it, uh who's you know, he's not in the band or anything, but I I was talking about what kind of music I wanted to to curate for this. And he just threw it out there and it reminded me of what a great tune it was. And it's mm -hmm. not covered very often. It's uh, not surprisingly, but it has this melody that just uh it's like an earworm. You know, it just, it stays with you. I wish I wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm just, uh, uh, as with all the other song titles, I'm 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 just a, a messenger, you know, trying mm -hmm. to preserve the, the heritage of this music. Um, but yeah, I can't wait to play it live. You know, we're going to be, we're going to throw that one in the set list <clears> because <throat> it's such a gem. I think people will recognize it right away, but they won't mm -hmm. know why. They won't right. quite know why, you know. Um, I think my our parents' generation they'll 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 know. Oh yeah, that's Andy Williams, you know. But uh, I think the younger generation may may know the melody or feel like they know it, and it'll just be one of those things, you know. You, you know, what's kind of scary is when you're talking about the older generation. It used to be Andy Williams and you know Johnny Mathis, but now. The older generation is the Woodstock generation. <laughs> that's right. You know, that's right. so yeah. that's kind of scary, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I went to see Gregory Porter uh, a couple years ago, and um, you know, he's such an amazing singer, and his mm -hmm. his, his his band is basically a quartet on stage, right. you know? and it's a jazz thing. It's a jazz quartet, but his audience. Um, may not necessarily just be into jazz mm -hmm. what, what i what i took from his show 
is that people are starving for a real singer to just right. walk up to a mic like Nat King Cole yep. and just man, just create those chills. Every song mm-hmm. there's chills. You're not you're not gonna make it all night without uh shedding a tear. Mm-hmm. It's just not won't let you, you know. And you know, he's got this this uh the baritone, rich tone, um, and then the, the way he phrases, it's 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 you know it's kind of Marvin Gaye meets Nat King Cole, mm-hmm. you know that that zone, and um, and he's you know he's bringing in not only songs that he he writes but also a lot of the the standards, mm-hmm. and uh, so he's educating the audience all the time. Yeah, you know the the new audience that may right. be not so familiar with um you know the the classics in the sense that um they haven't been around them mm-hmm. for as for as long you know as as um uh, you know anyone in their 40s or up you know yeah so um uh, but but uh you know seeing uh Gregory Porter mm-hmm. in in concert it was really a um a reminder man just just soak that melody you just like own that melody and and preserve it and you know as if you were in on it when the composer wrote it you know right and uh and deliver it that way and he does and it's just it reminded me okay man i'm an instrumentalist i I need to try to get there you know so he's my current um he's my current um inspiration you Mm -hmm. know because he's doing it you know for a wide audience and just people just want to hear that singing. Yeah, that I agree. Yeah. I recently saw Gladys Knight, packed oh, audience, packed beautiful. audience. And Tom Jones was here recently as well. Same thing. Okay. I mean, the energy yeah. level of the crowd was just like it was 30 years ago. And, That's you know, amazing. and he can't dance anymore. He has to sit down a lot. You know, right. I mean, I think he's in his 80s already. Amazing. But his voice is still there. You know, yeah. and he's pumping out new music, you know, so I'd love right. to see that, you know, yeah. people still love the classics. They, 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 they you know, yeah. that's right. And uh, especially now they even resonate even more. I think mm-hmm. they, they they have a, a kind of a profound impact now. Yep. I mean, there's YouTube videos of kids discovering yeah. this music, you know, they, they film themselves listening right. for the first time, you know, uh, which is crazy to me, but um also great you know um yeah i mean you can't argue with gladys Mm -hmm. she's gonna she's gonna phrase that that song to you she's gonna make you cry yeah now now now, you know now what are you gonna do you know (laughs) and you do cry when you hear the songs you grew up with you know i mean yeah you can't help it (laughs) you can't help it it's a beautiful thing it's really powerful it is powerful I remember in the seventies, you know, all this stuff on the radio, it just was on the radio. Yeah. Yeah. So it didn't have a, it didn't have a profound impact. It just right. had like a daily. It, impact. A day, like, exactly. Right. So you would hear Chicago, yeah. you would hear, uh, you know, um, uh, Steely Dan and that, you know, um, Billy Joel, you would just think that's the way it was. I, I know. <laughs> There's incredible <laughs> melodies and arrangements and harmony. Yeah. Yeah, everything going on, man, and you would think, oh well, you know, because I remember in, in, I was in a top forty band in, in high school, and we would have to learn this music, mm-hmm. and you would just by trying to learn their music, you would learn music, right? You would learn harmony and that's song right. structure. And if you you know if you try to learn uh, Steely Dan just by putting the needle back and forth on, on a record, you know. You're trying to figure out their voicings and their 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 sense of vo- vocabulary, <clears throat> but uh, so now today, man, you put that stuff on, it sticks out even more. It, it does, is, yeah. You know, because the current commercial scene, man, I I know people won't like me saying all this, but it it just doesn't match. It, it just no, it, just it sucks. That hard. <laughs> I'll you know, say it. Yeah, you can say it. I mean, <laughs> for me, man, I mean, I came up on melody, you know. Yeah. I don't hear melody. I yeah. hear a groove. Yeah. Groove is great. Yeah. I love, I love the groove of, of, right. of, of today, you know, and how it sounds. It sounds so beautiful and rich. It's produced. Yeah. But the top layer, now that now that that foundation sounds so great and that right. 
a track is amazing. Now I'm like, okay, where's the melody? And every right. time, not every time to be fair, but I would say nine out of 10 times, the song is served up. Here it comes melody. Yeah. And then, and then there's no melody. See, there's I'm no disappointed. Melody. It didn't improve, you know, from that era, you know, from the sixties right. and seventies, you would have thought it would have improved, but it never, it didn't. Yeah. It took a big step backwards. And, did, you know, yeah. they make such a big deal about Taylor Swift and she's selling out stadium. Come on, man. We had Carly Simon, Carol King, <laughs> Diana yeah. Ross. I mean, I, I can, Linda Ronstadt, they all blew Taylor Swift away. <laughs> but, <laughs> you, you know, know? In, the context, in, in the context of what, um, of what people are here, you know, it's all relative to to what you think is great. Yeah. You know what I mean, until you're taken over, you know, until someone takes you to the annex. You got it. The museum. Right. Like, oh, OK. Exactly. Well, I, didn't was, I didn't know that there was this and, th- and there was this that happened before I was on the planet. Now you're now you're now it's humble pie. You know, yeah. it's, now it's, you're like, oh, OK. And, you know, I think that's why there's a lot of vinyl being uh purchased today from the, from the 70s and right. 60s. I mean the kids are buying this stuff from yep buying bad company records, you know? <clears throat> and why is that, you know? And it's, they it's should. Not, it's, it's not the vinyl, <laughs> it's just the music was better. Yeah, the, there it was go. better. There's there there's, there's not a lot of bands. <laughs> there's no guitar heroes like there used to be. There's there's a few right. like Bonamassa and people like that. Oh man. I they're not them. they're not on commercial radio. They're not on top right. 40 radio, you know. Right. So. I think when the the labels uh, and this isn't like anything new, you know, mm-hmm. uh, w- w- you know, as far as my observation, but when the label started signing artists that couldn't play, right, and couldn't sing, now you get the result when you put on the radio today. Exactly, you get the result of the entire equation. And, yeah, and for me, it's like, man, how come there's no melody? There's no song structure. Yeah, there's you know, where's where's Boston? Where's you know where? Yeah. <laughs> Where's Earth, Wind, and Fire? Where's it's being sampled for a reason? Yeah, but it's it's not the core of the of the production. And, you know, uh, we used to knock disco. You know, I'm I'm a rocker. Yeah, we used to knock disco, but I I went to the discos and everything. But yeah, I'll same, take disco same, any same, any yeah. time <laughs> over what's going on today. I mean, right? They had great bands. They had you know they had the the horn section, which was really involved. Great bass. Right. They made the bass famous back in the disco days, you know. Yeah. I mean, they were yeah, this, good musicians back then. They really were. Yeah, it was it was a groove thing, of course. Yeah, there was a you know there was a hating disco phase that happened. Yeah, really, the bands, you know, um, the Bee Gees were remarkable, incredible. Uh, you know, Chic, mm-hmm. incredible. The Ohio you know, players with their Ohio horns, players, Earth, yeah. Wind, and Fire. They were all great Earth, bands. Yeah. And uh, when you listen to that music, you, you, you know, there's a, there's arrangements going on. There's yep. string arrangements. I agree. Uh, there's counterpoint. Um, it's just stuff that, you know, you know, they used to call it sweetening the track, mm-hmm. you know, in, in production. You right. Know, you, you had the song. Now you're going to sweeten it. And um, but you had to have the song first. Like the mm-hmm. song could live on its own. You know, everything else was just, you know, um, aesthetics. Mm-hmm. What I don't hear now is I hear, I don't hear the song. I hear aesthetics. Yeah, you know, and I think, um, I think that's why people are freaking out when they hear Gregory Porter. Just you know, right. just walks up to the mic and he starts singing. Exactly. Everyone freaks out. Yeah, me, myself included. Yeah, you know. So I think there's a, a you know, there's a um, pent up. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, maybe you know, de- <clears throat> demanded. Maybe not not the right word, but there, there's there's a there's a there's a want. You know, <clears throat> a passion. You know, when you when you take someone to a show and, and right. there's a band on stage and every and everyone's playing, there's yeah. no machines. It's amazing. It, it sticks out even more. You it know? does. <laughs> well, knows? how about how about Gregory Porter on your next album? <laughs> Guest that artist. That that would be a gift that would Guest be artist. Uh, yeah that would yeah. be that would be something i mean i and i know the folks over at blue note maybe really yeah. cool <laughs> so, hey man you were engelbert hubbardink's guitarist i mean <laughs> back in the day back that's the right day. yeah 
Yeah, yeah I, still, I still legend. remember the I still remember the cologne. Yeah, <laughs> it, it kind of stays with you. Yeah, he had some great tunes. <laughs> he had some great songs, man. Oh man, yeah. I remember them all. You know. Yeah. I mean, I was a I was a young freelance uh, journeyman guitar player, really. You know, right. Just coming up. And um, he had a, a you know arrangers on the road. Yeah. And uh, so you had to read uh, new parts on the fly. You know, at sound check, you would rehearse a tune that would be you know in the set list later on that night. So I learned. I learned. Um, I got my chops together just by being in that environment. You know, mm. where I had to play different guitars, have different sounds ready on the fly, and then. Um, and try to be musical, not just read, you know, you're trying to create something out of the chart. Sure. Um, and all of us shared that we all, we all cut our teeth on mm. the road, learning what that was about. Right. Because for him, it was the new arrangement of, um, of a song that was in, embedded in the set list and he would, he would get bored with them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, naturally. So, and so he would add a, an arranger would fly out to wherever we were and they'd have 10 new charts Wow. You know, and they'd hand it out in sound check. <laughs> and you didn't know which one was going to be included mm. or if any in the in the show that night, but they would show up later on and you know, a month mm -hmm. later, there it is. Yeah. So uh, you know, uh you kind of you learn how to be a professional musician, you know. Sure. At a very early age, you know. I just want to mention the last song on your album, A Night in Tunisia. Uh yeah. that's a another standard with dizzy gillespie right who was yeah right dizzy gillespie was yeah. that's his, that's his you know iconic tune wow yeah that's the one that gave me trouble on this on this album <laughs> it was this one didn't you do this yeah. before though on, on another album wasn't this on another album before or no uh for me no this yeah. is the first no? time okay. first time i i played it and uh yeah, but you, you, played, know, you played uh, it in concert, didn't you? Did you in a concert or something? We, we you did it? We, yeah, we, we did it in some shows, but I think uh, I saw it on YouTube. You got you playing it on YouTube or something. It, it could yeah. be. Um yeah. but we I think we you know we, we played it live, but I've I've never recorded it. Right. But uh this one was um I thought I'd just whistle right through it because I was so you know, I just knew the song, it's in my head, and everyone knows the song. But I found myself um taking a second look at the phrasing of the melody um, because in the context of Latin rhythms, there's a lot of counter rhythms going on. And so mm -hmm. the melody has to find its sweet spot. And uh, this was the, this was the one, this was the Rubik's cube. Um, so uh, I hope people like it. I'm, you know, when I hear this one, I'm like, Oh man, I could have used a couple more days in the studio with the fellas, you know, but it sounds, you just sounds live with them, great. man. Love it. You just, you just capture what you capture, and sure. um, hopefully, it's a good vibe. You know, for yeah. everyone. The whole album's a great vibe, man. I love it. It's it's Thank an you. album everybody can kind of listen to over and over again in different places, in the car, you know, on the beach, on vacation, at home. Oh, you know, it's, it's just a you know a relaxing, great piece of music. It really is. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's very, I, very nice I, of you to. to I enjoyed a lot to describe it in this way. And uh, yeah. you know, we're just trying to groove and be musical. That's yeah. That's that's the aim. You know. Well, I love the clean sound. I, I'm, sometimes I get tired of all the electronics. You know, they right. add so much electronics, they take the skill away. You know, you don't. You, yeah. It doesn't. I play guitar. I know. I know what it is. I can add a lot of stuff to my guitar and sound like a. You know, a right. heavy rocker, but it's not it's not the same. You know, it's yeah, it's uh, it's, it's it's sort of like you know when you pick up that acoustic and, and you're sitting on on the sofa. Yep. Then suddenly you hear everything. Exactly. That's the best <laughs> way to learn, man. My and, my uh, the first song I learned on acoustic was "Born Free." <laughs> oh man, there you go. Because it was easy. <laughs> I think for me yeah. it was uh it was a John Denver tune. Really. You know, that was I think it was in sixth which, grade, fifth grade. Uh huh. I think it was a John Denver song. Yeah. Which one? Do you remember? Uh, I don't want to say shine on my shoulders. <laughs> I think I think it was leaving on a jet plane because oh, that was okay, early, that's a good yeah, one. Yeah, because that was um yeah, that was more uh late uh, or rather early seventies, as far right. as I'm not mistaken. So yeah, that puts me in about fifth or sixth grade there. 
Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk touring. What's going to happen next? Well, you know, it's, it's been a while since we, we did shows and, um, there was a time where, uh, we were really busy with that and we're going to get back to it. Uh, we have more reason to, and we have, you know, more currency for booking agents to jump in, you know, and, and, and join the team. Um, my manager is working on that as we speak. I'm, I'm happy to say, and I'm happy to say I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> She's doing it. Well, these days uh, the wife does it. <laughs> yeah. In my case, it's uh, Amy Worthington. Uh, uh, you know, we've been working together, oddly enough, for, for years. I mean, going mm -hmm. back 20 years and yeah. in some form or another. And she comes from uh, King Crimson's world, you know, Robert Tripp. Yeah, and, uh, I saw that. Yeah, she's been doing uh, work in their label and managing their merchandise and just doing everything for them in the U.S. Really, mm. and I met her years ago uh, when I started my my label called Mundo Music, mm -hmm. and uh, it was her and Robert that that offered me um, office space in, wow. in their yeah in that? their as part of their thing. That's cool. And uh, so I was around a lot of the prog rockers for a few years there. Yeah, just by just by proximity. Yep. But, but they gave me a boost, you know, they got, they got me going, uh, independently. They gave me, um, distribution. I was distributed by DGM, which mm -hmm. is Robert's, um, yeah. Robert Fripp's label. Yep. So, um, and I remember him saying that, uh, I was a fit because I wasn't a fit, which turned out to be a classic Fripp moment, you know, <laughs> um, because, you know, I'm doing this kind of music, you know, it's not, yeah. prog rock, you know, yeah. but I love prog rock and, and so she she was managing all that, and she was helping me. Um, she introduced me to Jim Cuomo, who uh, is now uh, her husband, actually. And he was running Ryko Distribution, and Mundo was able to segue right into Ryko's world, and he, and he helped me out so much. And hmm. I learned I learned so much. I'll always be grateful and 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 um, thankful for that for that early uh that early start and that help that they that they offered me um i was looking for managers i was beginning to actually interview many and then i i, I met with uh amy for a lunch and we talked about it and it suddenly just became official you know uh without much <laughs> without a lot of uh you know complications and so i'm i'm really thrilled that she's um she's on the team and she's she's um championing my cause mm -hmm. So she's out there dealing with uh, all mm -hmm. the booking agents, trying to figure out uh, how we're going to partner with the right, yeah, with the right agency. And uh, so that's coming around. You know, we're going to end up good. on the road next year, and we're going to we're going to go hot and heavy. We're going to we're committed yeah. to hitting the road. So Pro stay tuned Prog for that. Prog artists are great players. You know, they do a lot of intricate stuff. I interview a lot of Prague artists from all all over the world, you know, because you, nice. you get, a lot of them, they got a lot of great new albums out, but I'm going to embarrass you a little bit. You uh -oh. went to Berkeley College of Music. Sure did. So you don't fool around. Um, <laughs> you studied composition at the New England Conservatory with yes. George Russell. Okay. Yeah, sure did. You were mentored under Tommy Tedesco from the Wrecking Crew. Right. So you qualify for a prog rock legend <laughs> <laughs> you know i just you know i've been around uh some great mentors you know yeah and uh, and, and a lot you know there's great mentorship available at a lot of music schools you know mm -hmm. uh, it's not that hard to find you know you, you just got to dig out the guys you want to work that you want to study with really you know yeah and so for me it was george russell it was uh gary burton um michael gibbs wow uh, people like that and i would read about them in downbeat magazine you know there was right. no internet you know at that time right and so they were very mysterious to me and uh like you know in a different on a different planet <laughs> you know like how do you get to these guys you know? <laughs> and um all <clears throat> all the arrows pointed to um getting to boston and so once that happened mm. uh you know, you're just you're you're around not only these guys, but the language and the culture of music that um, you know. Matheny had taught Pat Matheny had taught at, at at in Boston for a while. Huh. 
So uh, Mike Stern was there uh, playing around town. This was before he he was picked up by Miles Davis, you know. So he was like a local guy teaching guitar lessons and just being around Boston. And he would I would see him all the time when we were just kids. But we would see players like this rehearsing in the in the school practice rooms, you know. <laughs> Very cool. And it's a mind blower uh, when I think <laughs> about it. But that set the bar. So yeah. you see these guys hanging out, you know, Tiger Okoshi, um, Mike Stern, um, mm -hmm. Branford Marcel was, was yep. at Berkeley when I arrived. He was just finishing up. Um, but, you know, that's that set the tone. That set the, the bar, and you just go to your room and shed. Yeah. Because you're like, man, how am I going to – how am I going to even get to this, this place I want to get to, you know? Mm. How, how intense there were days, is there it? There were days I thought, man, this is not going to work out. I'm just going to go home, you know? <laughs> it's, that's too easy to do. You know, you got to stick with and it. It, it, it enters your mind. It enters yeah. your mind. Because you're around like these incredible players. And you're I like, know. Man, you know. I'm 19. I, I, I know, I know top 40. You right. Know? but not you know i didn't know the vocabulary yet you know do they at berkeley do they teach you theory and all that stuff i mean do they really oh man see yeah i had an instructor i was you know once and he started teaching me theory and that's when i bowed out i said i don't want to learn math yeah <laughs> I, it's math i just it's want totally to play math. comfortably numb you know <laughs> yeah. and, and for us guitar players you know, uh, theory is like uh, kryptonite too. It's like exactly. Man, I want to play by ear. You know, I just want to feel it, and that's great too. Um, and then you go through a thing. Okay, now you learn the math as as I did, and you realize, oh no, now I'm sounding academic. I'm sounding correct. Right, right. And then you realize, okay, that's that's vocabulary. You got to get to another level where you're just using the vocabulary at mm -hmm. will. Like you and I are just talking. We're not thinking of the words. Yeah. Right? And so that's theory. You want to get to the point where you're just, you're using the words, but you're not even thinking about them. And you may use the wrong word to say what you mean, but the other person still knows what you meant. Right. It's almost so, like coding, right? Like in computer yeah. coding or something. You so, know. yeah. So you're just communicating. And so you have to... But I remember hearing this from a lot of guys like, okay, you're gonna learn this, but then you gotta then you're gonna forget it. Right. You know, just, just be part of your system. Right. Now, you go you'll go back to playing by ear and playing what you want to play. But now your options are a little they're they're a little broader because you have more vocabulary attached to this, you know. But you risk losing and this is debatable, you know, You, but it, it, sometimes it feels like you risk losing some of the edge <clears throat> because you have too much academic. But still, I admire that. You, there's so many legends that don't read music. It's incredible. Right. They just, right. you know, by ear, which I don't know how they do that either, but you can right. actually compose and write, write the music, which a lot of right. people can't because like George Martin had to do it for the Beatles. You know, he had yes. to write the yeah. music for yeah. them, you know, that's right. So I admire that. Thank you. Well, I mean, yeah. my, my focus was really just to figure out how to, to compose, like, you know, right. Cause I would know about these standards and like, man, I wanted to try to figure out, can I write a standard? Right. It turns yeah. out that's a really hard thing to do. Um, but you're, then you're around the environment and, and everyone else is talking about the same thing and, and studying the same thing. And so um, there's a, magical like osmosis thing that takes place as well you know mm -hmm. cause you're just hanging out with your friends yep and trying to figure it out as you know as much as they can and then there's guys that jump out in school mm. they're the they tend to be like ex-prodigies mm. and they're the ones that you know ca cause you to think oh maybe this isn't going to work out i need to go home right do something, do something else and then right. you snap out of that yeah <laughs> but you go through it you go through this whole thing but yeah, uh, it it helped me, you know, as a session player and and as a side sure. man when it's I was hired. Because you know, when someone throws a chart in front of you, you got to make music out of it. Well, as a you know? as a band leader, it helps a yeah. lot, you know. And so when it came down to writing my charts for my guys, and all that all that study was really helpful. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I I was I'm in glad radio. I, I'm glad I did it. 
I did broadcasting. I went through broadcasting and I was a DJ back in the late seventies, did top 40. I did MOR, but my school taught me electronics theory. So on okay. paper, nice. I understood, but I couldn't fix a transmitter. So it's kind of the same right. thing. <laughs> and, I, and I almost bowed out twice. I, you know, I had long discussions with the, the head of the school saying, man, this is, this is blowing my mind. I mean, I just wanted That's to a be a DJ. You know? <laughs> That's a lot of math. A lot of math, about? man. Yeah, Electronics. Yeah, Oh, so I know what you went through, but, you know, when you want to play guitar and then you get all that math involved, it, it can get a little discouraging, I think. Yeah, it gets you know? in the way. Yeah. And it feels like it's a distraction. But later on, it kind of en enters your own vocabulary. Right. You know? Right. You know, the funny thing is, you know, I mean, I, you know, yeah, I went to music school, studied all that stuff. Right. But in the end, the very last day, who hands me my degree? B.B. King. Oh my God! Oh. Really? Whoa! So, BB King cool handed that? out the degree. It's just by chance. So I graduated when he oh, was the, man. Guess, unbelievable. You know, the honorary uh, recipient of 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 a of a doctor's degree. Wow! But every year they had someone of stature like that, you know. And so the the buzz around school was who was going to be this year, you know? Yeah. They they've had um, James Taylor. Mm -hmm. Paul Simon, you know, I mean, the list is incredible. Yeah. And uh, Quincy Jones. Wow. And for my year, it happened to be B.B. King. And I, and I always thought that was interesting because, you know, here I studied all this incredible theory and, and know-how and, mm -hmm. and all the technical stuff and all important, you know. But in the end, it was the guy. It's worth it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it was all, all great worth stuff. It. <laughs> all great stuff. But in the end, it was the guy. Who played by ear? Yeah, soulful. Yeah, who never went to music school. Yeah, and he's the one handing out the degrees. And I always wow. thought that was very interesting. The whole, you know, the yeah. irony of it all. The 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 just just the idea that uh, it wasn't uh, Doctor BB King handing yeah. out the degrees. Yeah, BB King, who mm -hmm. learned on the road yep. how to play and how to communicate with an audience. And so there's something to. I guess my point is there's there's something incredible and pretty pretty important to both sides of of your schooling. You, your your schooling can come up in a different way. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to be at a college, you know. Um, and there's great examples of this, you know. Um, you know, I, I mean, I listen to Eric Clapton. I don't hear music school. Yeah, right. I hear Eric Clapton. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean, and that's and it's beautiful. Yeah, it's great. Right. You know? But, um, but then when I hear Pat Metheny, I hear music school. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's a good point. And it's, be and it's beautiful yeah. and soulful and melodic yeah. and it's all, it's great. But I hear yeah. the vocabulary. Yeah. I hear the vocabulary. So it's, uh, there's great things about both of it, both sides of that, you know? I was looking at some of the guys you admire, uh, Quincy Jones, of course, uh, Miles, uh, Tito Puente, you know? Yeah, of um, course. Yeah, Jeff Beck and of course Carlos Santana. Um I interviewed the guy who taught Carlos Santana, Juan, Juan uh, um Batiste is his last name. And uh Juan Batiste. Wow. From Mexico. He was in okay. uh in Tijuana and we we talked about it. and his guitar playing sounds just like Carlos Santana. So Santana definitely took his style. <laughs> interesting yeah interesting. Have, have you met carlos santana yeah, I, yeah. i've met him several times um yep. some of his um um players his rhythm section ended up on some early records of mine oh um, cool they all became very friendly and um and uh yeah so i met carlos a couple of times through mutual um musicians and also through road managers okay you know? um and you know Carlos opened the doors for a lot of young players, you know, right. and he was there. He's a legend. Yeah. You know, he's a real legend. You know, he's, yeah. uh, he caused a lot of guitar uh, <laughs> lessons and, and, you know, for kids to want to buy a guitar, their first guitar, mm -hmm. Carlos Santana. And he also introduced Latin music to a, a lot right. of new year, new ears that never would hear Latin music. Yep. And, um, that dotted line from him to Tito Puente was always there, you know, Mm -hmm. And um, Oye Como Va was Tito Puente. That's know? right. A lot of people you know, don't know that. 
yeah. a lot of people don't know that. But if you if you went a little deeper into the liner notes, you were like, oh man, who's Tito Puente? You know, then, exactly. Okay, now you're going down that co- corridor, and you're gonna meet a you're gonna meet Tito Puente's <clears> world, <throat> you know, which is incredible, man. This is yeah. Nothing I want to add another guy to that list who I've had on my show. Great guy, Trini Lopez. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Trini, yeah, Trini was a good guy. Yeah. I was shocked when he passed away from COVID, of all things. You know, yeah. that's yeah, blew my mind. They're 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 going to do a special about him, like a, a documentary. And because wow. uh, I I I wanted my interview to be in my book, and they said I no see. because they were going to come out with this documentary first. Oh, really? Maybe after the documentary, you can put it in your book. The interview. Oh, okay. They didn't want to. Wow. Yeah, but and then he passed away, which was a real shame. Yeah, there's a list of there's an incredible list of of um, folks that we lost during COVID. Oh know? my gosh, yeah. it's still around. It's it's, it's still, still causing around. havoc, you know. It's still around. Yeah, I got to ask you, man, what is your association with the Power Rangers? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of all things, you know. <laughs> well, you know, in um, you know, it's. I'm going to try to keep this brief, but there's a whole <laughs> like a there's a storyline that just kind of uh, makes sense actually. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was running Mundo Music, uh, you know, my label, and uh, this was a time where um, all the stores started closing. Okay, it was like a whole sweep when it happened. It was like a fire, you know. Right, like right. Tower Records closed. Virgin Records. I know that sucks. Um, <laughs> I mean, they were just going down one by one. And yeah. digital was coming in and taking over. And that was a whole new frontier. Right. It was, it was you know, the wild, wild west. Mm. And I was distributed at that point by um, um, Warner Brothers, mm-hmm. and uh, which is great on the way out, by the way. It's just nothing but sexiness mm-hmm. on the way out. But when that all that product comes back. Yeah. Because the the records, you know, the stores were about to close, and they were right. getting, you know, they're only keeping superstar titles. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not so great being distributed by Warner Brothers at that time, right? When it's when the returns are coming in, so we ended up having to um, just demolish countless volumes of CDs, and it was a tough, it was a tough mm-hmm. thing. Uh, this was around uh, two thousand nine mm-hmm. when, when it happened, and I. I essentially closed the doors. I was like, "What? How is this? You know, how am I going to get past this? You know, everyone was devastated. And labels larger than my than my little boutique operation were also closing, um, as record stores were closing. So, <clears throat> I made some calls uh, to some friends. I said, you know, just letting them know uh, for TV production or film that I was available as a music supervisor. I was going to take a break." from uh, making records and shipping mm-hmm. them, acting as a label. And uh, so a friend of mine was working at Saban uh, Brands, mm-hmm. I'm Saban's company. He was the founder of um, and the creator of uh, the Power Rangers. So he called me. Um, and, you know, when you get a phone call that starts with, uh, man, you probably don't want to do this, but Here's what I got. <laughs> Somehow, you know, when you hear that, those words that you're going to do what they just <laughs> said you weren't going to do. Exactly. And uh, so that's what happened. And uh, b- before I knew it, I'm, I'm in Century City meeting with Haim Saban and his team. And they were, look- they were looking for a music guy to to manage all that music. Um, they had just purchased the, the brand back from Disney. Uh, he had sold it to Disney. And I was mm. buying it. Back. And um, now it's digital, right? The, the the whole new space, the whole the whole new business model had had changed, right? And so they need the rights issue uh, dealt with for all the music attached to the shows um, as it was shipping worldwide. So um, there are a lot of issues with rights and um, you know publishing rights um, that didn't translate so well to digital. Hmm. So I entered the space as a consultant to the company and I joined the team uh, full time within a year. I was there for 10 years. How about 10 years? <laughs> yeah. Music supervising, not only the Power Rangers, but the entire portfolio of, of shows. You did also um, Cheryl Crow, right? Didn't you work with 
That led to a, yeah. uh, a, a show where um, I pitched the idea of bringing Cheryl Crow in um, mm-hmm. to do a song. So um, I went down to her house in Nashville and I produced the track at, at, at her huh. studio. Great experience working with her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, when you work in TV, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of uh, capabilities, there's a lot of collaborations that would uh, <clears throat> normally wouldn't happen on the record side of things. Right. That's usually has a different consideration. You know, everyone's very protective of their brand, you know, but when it comes to, to TV and kids shows, uh, because she had kids, you know, her, her two boys were, um, you know, very young at the time. Mm-hmm. There was an instant affinity to um, to what we're doing, and so suddenly the manager, <laughs> the lawyer, everyone that's there to get, to protect her and artists like that, mm-hmm. they're all disarmed because she wants to do it because right. of her kids. And I and then I, now I'm on a plane going to Nashville, you know, <laughs> and I'm in her house, you know, producing the track with her. And she was so great, yeah, and uh, so professional, right. And, Talk about someone that studied music. Huh. You could tell. You could tell. I mean, she, she studied solfege. Um, her sense of um, of um, intonation, singing in tune, was well. She was. She was a was teacher, wonderful. right? She was a yeah. She yeah. was a music teacher. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and we talked about her past <laughs> as a, as a, as a backup singer. You know, mm-hmm. from Michael Jackson and most right. other people. And so we just hung out. It was just a hang, you know. And um, to her credit, she she let me produce her vocals on on a track uh, without, um, you know, any um, any ego attached to it. Yeah. She was basically, she was basically like, "What do you want me to do?" You know. And I I was able to to direct her, and she was open to my direction, and it was great. It was great. I had nothing but uh, hmm. I have nothing but, um, wonderful things to say about about her and her musicianship, her level of musicianship. It was it was really great to see that. And I sensed it. I mean, I, I'm a fan, you know, for records. You, you kind of can tell when someone has it together. Right. It's not all tricks in the studio. Exactly. You know? And um, so to, to be up front with her in, in her space and, and, and experience it, man, it was it was great. And it was all because of my title as a in-house producer, right. uh, music supervisor. For Heim Saban's company, uh, so the Power Rangers, you know, my work with the Power Rangers led to Cheryl Crow. Amazing, you know, life yeah. is funny, man. You, you know? never know. You all, never know. All you have to do is pay attention, you know. Yeah, <laughs> your resume is incredible. I mean, there's so many things well, that you can do if you really want to put yourself out you. there, and but you like doing what you're doing. That's the main thing, you know. Well, thank you. I'm, you know, uh, I'm just curious. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, me too. They have they have they have acronyms for guys like us, you know. Yeah. Well, let, let, <laughs> listen just, to this. I'm just curious. I'm just totally into it, and and I'm a fan. Yeah. You know, I'm a yeah. fan of all of it. So, I I own retail electronic stores. I owned a oh, cool. full service dry cleaning plant. I was wow. a bank. I was a banker for what 12, 13 years. So there's there's the math right there, man. <laughs> Music journalist for 11, 12 years now, author, right on. written several books. So it's the same thing. You just keep moving around, man, whatever works. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, if you're interested in things, that's, you know, you're, you're uh, it's like you're walking up to that door that says don't enter. And you're like, exactly. hey, what's going on in here? You know, what are you, yeah. what are you, guys, what are you guys doing here? You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you went to Berkeley. I didn't go to college. I went, I actually went to, my school was owned by CBS. It was a technical school. Because okay. I didn't want to, ha- I didn't want to go through that college thing. I just wanted to learn, you know, what I needed to learn to get out there and become a yeah. radio well, star. You know, <laughs> it's relatable because music schools are, are are basically technical schools, right? Right. Like we don't have we don't have the football team. Yeah, exactly. You know? We don't have the the frats. You know, the fraternities and the, you don't need the, to get all these other credits and different subjects and all that other stuff. Right. I didn't I didn't want to do that. Yeah, it was yeah. my experience was very similar. It was really about um, the practical aspect of, of, of yeah. uh, working working as a musician. And exactly, that was, the that was the chatter all day long. Like, this is what's going to happen when you guys go out there and work. You know, yep. Get over it. You're going to have to have to know this. You're going to have to know this. And blah blah blah. And um, so, when I finished school, I'm sure you felt this too. You were kind of you felt ready to just get a gig. 
I left no. early to, and I got a gig early. We there had we had a TV course after radio course, but I had taken TV in high school for two years. Okay. So nice. I, I said, I don't want to get into TV. So they, they actually had a job placement. Yeah. And my first job was actually in, in Florida, in Sebring. And my okay. last job was in Annapolis, a station that Pat Sajak uh, bought later on. Oh, wow. Yeah. There you go. Pat Sajak. I Pat Sajak. Pat Sajak. <laughs> okay. So now full circle back to Engelbert. Right. You played the Pat Sajak show. Oh, you <laughs> Everything's no, related, it's, man. It's all, all connected, man. It's all connected. Funny. That's yeah. that's crazy. Here, yeah. Here's your final question. Okay. okay. I ask this question to everybody. I get some really interesting answers. Okay. If you had a Field of Dreams wish, that's my favorite movie, by the way, um, to perform, collaborate, be a band leader or whatever to this band or a bunch of people from – Anyone from the past or present, who would that be? You can put together a whole band if you want. <laughs> well, for me, it would be playing with Miles Davis. Miles Davis, I get that. I get that a lot. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. It would, and 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 any of any of the iterations that that he he created, you know, because he had many forms of music that he dealt with, you know. Right. Um, I, I would have been fine with all of them, any of them, you know, and uh. And I, and I know that even more now than ever because uh, I've you know I've I've had chats with guys who've played with Miles. Um, yep. There's guys who've been on on my records that, that, that have played with Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. And um, and then through interviews, any anyone who's played with Miles Davis, you know, I'm convinced that that was the the ultimate schooling that one could experience. I mean, I, I'm convinced of it. So it, I hear that a lot. Yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah. I heard that through had, Billy Cobble. He yeah. And John McLaughlin also. Oh yeah. All, yeah. all, all, all my heroes had, had, a, had played with him or I had a connection yep. with that. It's, um, you know, with his, um, you know, his, his journey and, mm -hmm. uh, but he had an innate, um, understanding of, of, um, not just music, but he under had, he had an understanding of musicians. And that's part of the secret of what how he 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 was able to succeed in the way mm -hmm. he did. He understood musicians. Yeah. And um, so not only are you are you hip to the language, you know, right? Um, but you're also you, you're you're into this. Um, you understand humanity, you know, um, to the point you know it can go both ways, man. You could, you could be loving or you could be, you know, um, ma manipulative, you know, because your understanding is so profound. And I think Miles Davis was complex in this way, you know, mm -hmm. that's my, that's what I hear. That's what I'm, that's my understanding. Yeah. So there's some risky business, you know, right. Even so I would say I would, I would deal with it. Yeah. You know, I would just go with it and because the experience would only <clears throat> bring up your musicianship. I hear Coltrane a lot and yeah. I could I could see you because of your background and everything being in Buddy Rich's band. <laughs> He's a tough cookie too, isn't he? He, he was a tough cookie. <laughs> he was legendary for that. Yeah. Uh, the guys at Berkeley would come back, they would join his band. He would he would always get uh horn sections from mm -hmm. from Berkeley. He would get like um hmm. the new kid that could play the uh, you know high trumpets uh high trumpet parts right and so they would go on the on the road with them for a couple months blow out their chops <laughs> and come back to school and then we would wow. all hear the stories yeah We'd all hear the stories yeah and he was tough he was tough on on all the kids right they were all young music uh grads or mm -hmm. halfway through school and he would they jump on the bus and get the buddy rich badge you know yeah but he was tough I think it, for me, I think he was the greatest drummer ever. It was Buddy Rich. That's that's my yeah. opinion. But I I, uh, I, th I think it, I think all the great drummers would point to Buddy Rich. Yeah, yeah. he was just so fast, you know. And, yeah, and clean. And clean, exactly. Yeah, very clean. Yeah, you could transcribe what he played. Yeah, you know, and put a book out and say, "Okay, this is Buddy Rich." <laughs> yep, exactly right. He was incredible, uh, man. But you know, in those days, you know, back in my my high school days, um, Buddy Rich, uh, Tommy Dorsey, um, 
Maynard Ferguson. Mm -hmm. They would all do concerts. Uh, Count Basie. They would That's all right. do concerts at high schools. Yeah. Playing high schools was part of their itinerary. They would mm -hmm. come through town. They would play high school. And uh, so even as kids, you, you, you were around like these amazing musicians. And uh, I'm not sure that happens anymore, you know. Uh, we're, we're, we're kind of, the players of that stature would just come through a high school and play right. a concert, but that was normal. Um, when I was coming up, that was like a normal thing. Yeah, I I know Billy Cobham. I've had him on the show several times, and he, you know, he 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 does this. Uh, he brings in a lot of musicians, and he does this teaching thing. I think you teach too, right? Yes, I've taught at a few colleges. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you guys love to teach. You really do. All the great <laughs> players love to teach, you know. But, I, I uh, enjoy it. Yeah. I, I'm currently teaching uh, music business at uh, Santa Barbara City College. Oh, cool. Um, I'm doing the online course. So it's all yeah. it's all a big Zoom class, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Well, I'd love to learn from you. That'd be great. As long as you don't throw theory at me, I'll be all right. <laughs> no more math. No more, <laughs> no more math. math, man. Yeah, I can't yeah. take it. My head's gonna explode. Juan Carlos, yeah, what's so, next? What, what's next for you? Do we cover just about well, everything? I, you know, we're already working on next year. Okay. On on, on uh, what that record um, will look like. Um, uh, Amy Worthington, my manager, um, she's already suggested. Uh, that I do a Christmas album. With yes, you know I was going to mention that. Yeah, that, that's very important because <laughs> if you hit, you can hit it big with that, man. Make tons of money. <laughs> well, I put out a Christmas album a few years ago, and it was a trio. Um, okay. A, um, nylon guitar, drums, and upright bass. It's right. It's a very specific sound, very intimate, and it was one of the hardest projects I ever did, actually. And. um I mean, I went into it naively thinking, oh, man, you know, it's just Christmas songs. What's the big deal? I just do these little arrangements. Man, it was nothing but hard. It mm. was difficult because uh, I had to come up with arrangements on the guitar, like guitar, chord, melody type playing. Yeah. Um, there was no piano player. It was just right. myself, drums and bass. And it's Christmas song, so mm. you gotta you, you gotta be careful. People want to hear the songs; they want to hear the melodies. So you can't get all hip and crazy with it. <laughs> yeah, and and get off the grid. You, you gotta you gotta somehow add something new to Jingle Bells. Right? Yeah, yeah, okay? exactly. Just think about how hard that is. Man. Well, you gotta me, compose something new. You know that. Yeah. you got to. You, you you can't just do covers. It, so, it shows you though uh, how how genius the Charlie Brown albums were, huh? Exactly. Vince, Vince Garoppolo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What that was, I mean, incredible. That fantastic music. They yeah, put and together. you forget that it's a jazz trio. It's, it is a jazz like trio playing, That's like right. really, really playing. Yeah, and uh, so we try to follow that. You know, very similar where you want to stay yeah. melodic. Uh, stay true to the songs right. and yet get, get a performance going so um, now with, with this rhythm section um, this would be a totally different thing you can do be, it it would be like these albums thank you it would be sort of <laughs> like these albums but with, with the Christmas thing so I'm already looking at that um, but I, I've also started working on a, a new record of originals going back to the original you know, Good. to the composing side. Yeah. So we'll see what 24 uh, brings. Uh, awesome. It's either going to be the Christmas album or a brand new one with, uh, you know, original works. I just want, one. I just want to remind you about Jose Feliciano and uh, Feliz Navidad, a very simple tune, man. And he hit it big. <laughs> he hit it big. And, yes. And he's a great guitar player. He man. is. He people is. realize what an amazing guitar player he is. He is. And, uh, I've heard him play electric where he does like a Jimi Hendrix thing. I never heard him play electric. And man, that the the guy can play. It's really incredible. yeah. Like, and that's his I used to think his secret secret weapon was his rhythm because his rhythm right. is beautiful. Yeah. I mean, you're basically hearing a percussion section. Yep. When he plays that rhythm. But really, man, when he when he goes off and he as a lead player, hmm. 
it, it, it's mind blowing. Yeah. So I, I love to I hear his electric. I got to story. witness it. Yeah. Huh. We did we did some shows together. I got to witness it. Yeah. First concert I ever went to was Jose Feliciano and Curtis Mayfield. I think it was oh, nineteen seventy one. I think. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, was uh, Feliz Navidad already happening? No, that was before no, that. That was before. Way huh? before yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was doing Susie Q and uh, Light My Fire and you know yeah. stuff like that. Standard. Great artist. Yeah. He's fantastic. Fantastic. But well, uh, Carlos, yeah, we're 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 going to get into some new stuff and then uh, and then uh, of course Christmas album is all covers. Um, but even on my on, on a record with new music for, for, uh, that's not the Christmas project, I'll sprinkle in some covers because okay. it's, it's just fun to do arrangements on. Oh, on I love your covers. Stuff. They're great. Yeah. And the older, the better. <laughs> that's what I'm finding. <laughs> you, you go deep in the catalog, man. There's always these there's, gems. There's, there are oh, gems. Yeah. There are. Yeah. I just wish the kids, they, they've got all the tools that they're exp- you know, they they got the the, the the smartphones or whatever. You can look up anything you want, you know, and they 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 should, because yeah. I I knew all my dad's music. He yeah. he liked Mary Olanza, um, you know, I I go way back, you know. Yeah, Sinatra sure. was always playing in our house, you know. Right. Yeah. Nat King Cole, Ray Charles. Uh, he he liked he really liked um, um. Gosh, I'm losing it now, man. That's what happens when you get over 60. <laughs> Johnny Cash. He was really into Johnny Cash. Oh, as well. yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, there's a there's a there's a certain um, <clears throat> there's a uniqueness to that understated kind right. of dark, darker sound where it's, 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 the storytelling is the thing, yep. you know. Um, yeah, it's great. And you played acoustic. <laughs> you played you acoustic. Know, it, yeah. You know, I, I played in Tahiti uh, years ago and we we did a series of shows there, which was right. really like a, a paid vacation, to be honest, you know. But I went into <laughs> the music store and um, I never forget this because I I mean, I haven't experienced this anywhere else. But I went into, I, I guess, the main music shop in Papeete, the main island. Mm-hmm. And everything was alphabetized, everything. So there was no rock section. There was no jazz section country section or you know polynesian section right it's all alphabetical huh. so i've got a i've got a picture of my, of my of my albums next to queen and queen's reich because of the alphabet and uh <laughs> when is that ever going to happen again <laughs> but i remember thinking man that th- they figured it out they were like this is this is how the audience deals with music they love right. everything yeah, and they don't need they don't need genres. So they were that's right. That. And their radio mm-hmm. station, I don't know if that's the case anymore, but at the time, the radio station played everything. Yeah, everything. That's and right. No, Especially no in the sixties. Yeah. yeah, no riots in the streets. No, nope. no, no issues. Everyone loves everything. So that was a good lesson for me, man. And so that's how I see this. You know, we just my genre happens to be Latin jazz, but. Man, you know, I just may cover Nirvana, you know. With <laughs> you never know. Some, some congas, you know, it's all, yeah. it's all great. You know who was you good know? at mixing it up was Bill Graham. He used to put, you know, mix up the concerts like that, you know, things that you yeah. wouldn't expect. Which I, read, a, I read his book. It's it's fascinating. Guy was intel- very intelligent guy. Yeah. Yeah. He, tr- he trusted the audience. Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. The free of genres, he would he he would have uh he would have Jimi Hendrix and Humperdinck on the same bill. Yeah, yeah, and Count and I Basie. Know that. And, I know and, that know. because because Humperdinck, <laughs> Humperdinck used to tell me that story all the time. Really? But, uh, oh man, can't yeah. imagine that. Yeah, I remember seeing. Uh, I saw Uriah Heep with Earth Wind ah. and Fire, and ZZ Top. I thought that was a interesting mix even jose feliciano with curtis mayfield that was an interesting exactly mix as well yeah yeah Yeah, because the audience wants to go for uh, for a ride man sure you know and they're hip that's right we we don't need to market them in terms of genres right they're they're free of that exactly they prove prove it all the time yep The, the music industry needs to change back to the better you know it really does 
If I had I the mean, money, I'd buy a radio station. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> It'd be uh, a great station. <laughs> I played I played this festival and it was a funk festival in Sacramento. This, really? This was a couple of years ago. And my booking agent at the time, he would he would do that like uh routinely, you know, he would just put us in these shows that on paper it just looked right. crazy, you know. And I remember uh I think it was Frankie Beverly and Mays mm -hmm. where they were, Mays. They were the yeah. headline. And we played right before uh you know the headliner. And I remember thinking, this is not gonna work. <laughs> like I was tripping. No one else was. <laughs> and the promoter took me aside. He saw he saw me kind of freaking out. Right. It was all backstage and stuff. And he took me aside. He said, he told me, he said, Man, just do your thing. Don't worry. I I I purposely booked you. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. it was like this is no accident you know i'm the one that booked you here you know how how was the audience how did they react you know what we we played that we played we opened with a cumbia uh -huh. a, a, you know rhythm from colombia and um we we trade you know i stayed true to what we do we we we, we mm -hmm. made that commitment and um the place freaked out everyone loved us everyone. See? And it was such a lesson. It was such a humble lesson, man. Because I yeah. went in, I saw the audience, the demographic, and all yeah. this stuff, and the, my marketing mind went to work. You know, oh, uh, this audience isn't for us. This is the wrong thing. And I right. had all these, all this so-called intellectual mm -hmm. uh, busyness going on. Mm -hmm. that got in the way of what was really going on. And what was really going on was just people wanted to love you, man. They just sure. wanted to experience something. That's right. That's why they were there. Exactly right. It didn't matter that it was called the Funk Festival. Yeah. You know? And uh, it turns out, you know, uh, we we played with some funk, too. It's just yeah. not the funk you think about, but sure. it's funk, you know? It's just <laughs> funk from, from South America, you know? Yeah. And that audience was so hip mm -hmm. that I'll always remember that because mm -hmm. it was such, it was such a, a lesson. Mm-hmm. To drop all this stuff that we're 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 always talking about in terms of this audience, this age, this demographic. Exactly, that's what they do nowadays. And if you're if you're true, yeah. if you're being true, they'll know it. Exactly. They'll they'll know they'll know if you're if you're being authentic. Sure. And they're and they're they're on your side. Yeah. And I learned I've I've kind of learned that lesson over and over in many instances, but that was the one that sticks out mm -hmm. because. I was convinced it wouldn't work. Right. You know, and for a song. Yeah. We had, we were, we, it was, it was a big love fest, you know? Hmm. And uh, I felt like I could play anything. Yeah. Cause they were just, they were just giving this vibe to us. It was so, so beautiful, man. But yeah. It was Woodstock like 5,000 like people. That. Woodstock it was, was open, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Open festival, yeah. 5,000 people plus you can see them, you know, over this hill. Man, yeah, it was incredible. Woodstock incredible. had a nice mixture of different, a variety of music, you know? Richie yeah. Havens opened it up for, what, there an hour go. and a half or something like that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. One guitar. Yeah. Acoustic. And That's he's right. Beating the, he's beating the hell out of it. I know. And I talked to Melanie. Melanie was yeah. just her and a guitar. She was scared to death, by the way. I bet. <laughs> But wow. uh, yeah, I mean that's like you said, no gimmicks. You're out there exposing out yourself, there. and you know, yeah, the audience wants you to go for it. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's sort of watching like this trapeze act. You know, right? You, you, right. you want them. To, you want them to win. You yeah, know? sure. <laughs> exactly land right. On your feet, you know? Yeah, <laughs> don't fall. <laughs> yeah, you want them to make the landing. You know, Juan well, Carlos, so, uh, man, you, thank you so much you, for being on the show. I oh really man, Ray! What a, what a treat, man, to meet you. And, and, oh and man, we, you got to come to Florida, man. You got to come to Florida. Count me in. Yeah, I want to say very special thanks to the great Billy James of Glass Onion PR for arranging this interview with Juan Carlos Quintero, and uh, purchased a new album, which is called Desserts. And I, I, I guess the best place right now is to go to your website. Uh, yeah, the, the website's album. great, uh, but you know we're on all the platforms. Amazon, so, yeah, the usual, yeah, all the all the usual suspects. We're, we're there. It's <laughs> www.juancarlos.com. 
Quintero.com. Um, you're on Facebook as well. All the avenues. Yeah. All the and, avenues. Uh, yeah. I'm also publishing your discography of all your all your albums so people can, oh. you know. Great, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, man. Muchas gracias, amigo. Gracias, man. Thank <laughs> you so much. And what a treat to, to meet you, Ray. And uh man, keep doing your thing. It's, Thank it's you. a special thing you've got going on. And and uh I'm sure I'm, I'm sure you've got fans from from all the players and support from everyone that uh you know, I've done a lot of interviews, man. It's that you know, it's not a given they're gonna it's gonna flow like this, right? You know? And uh so I appreciate you, bro. Thank it's you, fun. Man. I love the music. And I don't know where I'd be without the music. It hey, got me through a lot yeah. of tough times, man. I hear that. Um, yeah. yeah. And your music is incredible. And you keep okay. doing what you're doing. Looking forward to the new the new music. And we'll get you on yeah. again when, when you got another album coming out. Perfect. Okay? Look forward. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Take care. Bye-bye.